The year is 2005. I'm in a grocery store picking up some food. While at the checkout line, I see a rack of magazines in the distance. One of them is an issue of PlayStation Magazine. The front cover has a young yet familiar white-haired man on it with three big words underneath him. Yeah, you already know where this is going. Devil May Cry followed by the number three. Without hesitation, I broke away from the line heading straight for the rack. Picking up the magazine and flipping through it, I quickly found what I was looking for. I was standing there in the middle of a grocery store, reading an article about a new Devil May Cry game in development. The game's story was set well before the events of the first game, featuring a teenage Dante facing off against his twin brother on top of a giant demon tower. Everything I was reading, from the story to the gameplay, was getting me fairly excited. I was getting cautiously hyped for this DMC3 project. After this discovery, I followed the game on and off, but I wasn't intensely excited about it like I was with DMC2, probably out of fear for it being a potential disaster like its predecessor turned out to be. Sometime later, I remember being in a mall with some friends where I saw DMC3 in a video game store. I remember saying out loud, Oh yeah, that game totally came out a little while ago. I completely forgot about it. I ended up purchasing the game and rushing home with my buddies, and we played DMC3 all day into the late hours of the night. The game was really difficult, but also incredibly rewarding when we eventually overcame whatever boss or level we were stuck on. The first and second bosses were giving us real hell. Each time someone had the controller in hand, that person died at least twice. This game was no joke. We eventually got to Mission 7, where you fight Dante's twin brother, Virgil, and this is where we stopped because it was getting way too late. The next day, by myself, I continued my save file. I got a little bit further beyond Virgil, but I still met incredible resistance from this title's other levels and bosses. Even with just playing the first nine levels, I was already much happier with Devil May Cry 3 than I was with the previous entry. I didn't feel empty this time. I was having so much fun seeing a younger, more energetic, and very talkative Dante whipping demon ass, throwing out taunts at these giant monsters, and earning their respect after defeating them. With every new level and enemy, I had one goal in mind, to get better and learn everything that I could about my current situations. It took me a few more weeks to finally finish DMC3, and with it finally completed, this title became one of my favorite video games of all time. The characters, story, and gameplay were all incredibly satisfying to experience. I'm really excited to tell you guys all about DMC3 in today's video, but before we do that, let's talk about how director Hideaki Itsuno and his team went from cleaning up the mess that was DMC2 only a few months before its release to making one of the best action video games of all time. So, right after DMC2's release and less than favorable reception, Itsuno and his team quickly got to work on their next game. One of the dev team's major goals was to re-examine everything that made DMC1 such a fun and well-crafted game and to apply that design philosophy to DMC3's development. Things like DMC1's battle system, the beautifully rendered and enclosed environments, and Dante's overall cocky personality would all make a return in this third game. For the story, known Japanese novelist Bingo Morihashi would be brought onto this project from his work on DMC2, but this time in a much greater way, writing the entirety of DMC3's scenario. Capcom was really pulling out all of the stops with this game, getting really talented people involved to make something very memorable. Another goal the dev team had was to make sure that DMC3's battle system System was truly stylish. All of the things you could do in gameplay should fall in line with what Dante does in the cutscenes. Using motion-captured professional stuntmen from the company Just Cause Entertainment, and utilizing wire rigs and other action movie filming techniques, the devs were able to create incredible over-the-top action scenes, as well as flashy in-game animations. I will be talking more about Just Cause and their influence on this game later on. One of the biggest complaints reviewers and players had with Devil May Cry 2 was that it was very easy and lacked a lot of challenge challenge in all areas of combat. This low difficulty implementation originally came about through surveys taken during DMC2's development from Japanese gamers. At this time, Capcom found that Japanese players were more likely to enjoy an easier experience in adventure-type games like this. As we all saw with DMC2's worldwide release, basically everywhere else wasn't on board with the super easy battles DMC2 was offering. To address these difficulty concerns, the Japanese release of Devil May Cry 3 was a little bit easier than the version the rest of the world got. And as I said before, the version I played here in the US was hard as nails. This extreme difficulty would make a lot of fans happy, but the general consensus was that the game was way too hard for the average player not looking to absolutely master all of the game's mechanics. It's like Capcom and Itsuno took all of the complaints about DMC2's lack of challenge to heart and released an insanely difficult follow-up as a result. Like, you happy now, America? 
Only one year after DMC3's release, a special edition of the game came out with a plethora of new features, like being able to play as Dante's brother Virgil, but most importantly, the completely rebalanced normal and easy difficulty settings that felt very similar to the original Japanese version of the game. I should mention up front that I will be talking about the special edition of DMC3 because I didn't feel like going into full overdrive for this video. Nearing the end of development, the higher-ups at Capcom were impressed with what the dev team was making and predicted very good sales from DMC3. MC3, greenlighting the special edition pretty much before the initial version of the game was released. Alright guys, that's enough history lessons for now. It's time we got into this video proper. Let's talk about DMC3's new and improved stylish gameplay. Just like the first two games that came before it, DMC3 is a hack and slash adventure game where you explore the environment, fight demons, and collect red orbs to upgrade your equipment. Like I mentioned earlier, the devs wanted to go back to the first game and apply a lot of what made that game great for Devil May Cry 3. This included getting rid of pretty much all of the gameplay changes from DMC2. The very satisfying delayed button input combos make their return instead of DMC2's weird directional combos. All of the in-game environments have been scaled down to tightly crafted battle arenas, like in the first game, rather than having the massive open-ended, mostly empty, level design from DMC2. A bunch of smaller things from DMC1 also make their return in this title. Dante's dodge roll has been reverted back to being a lock-on directional-based input instead of it being mapped to a single button. The starting pistols Ebony and Ivory aren't overpowered like they were in 2, and they also shoot rapid fire again if you tap the button fast enough. If you were to play the first three games one after another, you'd notice that DMC3 feels like the true sequel to DMC1 in the gameplay department. And that feels good, because not only does this game bring back the original formula, but it also really improved upon it. Another improvement made to this game is the completely reworked style meter. So like in the first two games, the better you play, the higher your style rank would rise. The conditions for this weren't super clear in those games, and a lot of the time mashing out the same combo was enough to make your style rank in Increase. In DMC3, your combos have to be stylish. You cannot repeat the same attacks over and over again. You have to mix up all of what you know to create a unique combo. Physically seeing a meter increase and then earning a new letter grade feels freaking awesome in the heat of battle. By the way, your style score increases the number of red orbs gained at the end of every mission. Better play equals more currency, which unlocks more stylish moves. And speaking of style, the biggest addition to DMC3 is the all-new style action system. At the start of the game, you have access to four different styles. Trickster, Swordmaster, Gunslinger, and Royal Guard. These four styles add a unique action to Dante's moveset. You can only have one style equipped at a time, but you can swap between them at the Goddess of Time statues scattered throughout the various missions you'll be playing through. Trickster focuses on evasive movement. The style action performs a quick dash in any direction you point the movement stick in. Dashing into a wall performs a wall run, moving Dante either straight up or horizontally along the wall. You can also use this dash to close distance and dodge into an enemy attack, avoiding all damage in the process. If used efficiently, Dante can go through an entire level avoiding all enemy attacks and taking no damage. It really makes you feel like a badass when you're in the middle of a combo, but then slide out of the way at the last second, avoiding another enemy's attack. Trickster is my favorite style, without a doubt. Swordmaster adds a new ground and aerial-based combo attacks to all the melee weapons you'll be using. This style is perfect for combo masters looking to extend their combos even further. Gunslinger focuses on stylish gunplay, and this is actually where the devs took some of what DMC2 brought to the table. In Gunslinger, you can now shoot two different enemies with your pistols depending on where you're pointing the movement stick. All of the other guns have additional attacks thanks to this style. There's not too much to talk about here, but it's still interesting and gives gun users more options to play around with. Royal Guard is a defensive style, using parries to deflect incoming attacks. The cool thing about Royal Guard is that every attack you successfully parry builds up energy that you can use to deal damage back at your enemy, using the incredibly powerful Royal Guard release. This style is probably the most difficult to get into, but once you get the hang of it, much like Trickster, you can go through entire levels avoiding all damage and looking like a total badass. If all of this wasn't cool enough, the more demons you defeat with a particular style equipped will build up that style's experience and eventually level it up, adding even more options to that style's moveset. So for example, with Trickster, you start with one dash. In level 2, you gain a double ground dash and an air dash. Finally, at level 3, you unlock a triple dash and an actual teleport you can use to instant transmission right up to an enemy. So by the end of the game, you'll be pretty godlike in whatever style you're using. Oh, and one last thing, there are two more styles that you'll unlock as you play through the game. 
Quicksilver and Doppelganger. I'll let you figure out what those two do on your own. Aside from the different styles you can experiment with, Devil May Cry 3 also features a ton of new weapons. So in DMC1, you mostly used different swords that had similar movesets from one another. You also acquired the Ifrit Gauntlets, which used powerful hand-to-hand -hand attacks. Devil May Cry 2 featured some of the laziest weapons I've ever seen in a video game, literally only being swords that all had the same moveset. DMC3 has five completely unique melee weapons, which all have distinct movesets and uses in your combos. As you can imagine, at the start of the game, Dante has his longsword Rebellion and his dual pistols Ebony and Ivory. As you progress, you'll be acquiring new weapons from bosses and completing certain optional challenges. These range from things like a shotgun, rocket launcher, nunchucks, dual swords, gauntlets, and a freaking guitar. That's right, this party really is getting crazy. Before every mission, you get to set up your combat loadout, which includes bringing two ranged weapons and two melee weapons. And like in DMC2, these weapons can be swapped on the fly during gameplay. With DMC3's advanced combo system, you now have the ability to quickly switch between your melee weapons in the middle of a combo. This helps a lot in varying up your attacks and building style in a really fun way. You have so many options to experiment with in combo creation. Oh yeah, and as you've probably guessed, each weapon will work differently or become more powered up when using a certain style, like Gunslinger or Swordmaster. It's kind of mind-blowing how deep this game is compared to the first two DMCs. Director Hideaki Itsuno worked on a lot of Capcom fighting games before DMC3, and a lot of that technical fighting game design is reflected in DMC3's battle system. If I had to describe this title to someone who didn't know what a hack and slash game was, I'd call DMC3 a third-person adventure fighting game. I feel like that description sums up a lot of what this game is doing with its mechanics. By the way, my favorite loadout is Trickster, Rebellion, and Beowulf on melee, with Ebony and Ivory and Kalina Ann on my ranged attacks. The Devil Trigger system acts a lot like how it did in DMC1. You can't customize it like in DMC2, but having that small feature excluded is fine with me. So like you'd expect, popping DT enhances your speed, it gives you HP regeneration, and strengthens all of your attacks. DT has a new function in this game, the Devil Trigger Explosion. Now you can hold the DT button down to charge up this powerful attack. The more DT gauges you charge, the more damage you'll inflict. If you power this thing up all the way, you can take out a full group of weaker enemies with one shot. For bosses, you can save this explosion as a combo ender to cash out a lot of damage. I've finished off bosses with DT Explosion when they've had a pretty decent chunk of their HP remaining. This attack is incredible. You know what else is incredible? My new Devil Trigger form. Okay, let's see what happens this time. Please no sexy outfit, please no sexy outfit. Oh, oh man, man. now this, this is what I'm talking about. about. Hell, Hell yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a real deal now. now. Anyway, DT Explosion works really well against- Oh, I should turn it back. It's kind of hard to understand what I'm saying. Sorry about that, I got a little carried away. By the way, I just want to say that the DT forms in this game look so cool. They were designed by legendary Japanese artist Kazuma Kaneko. He was responsible for creating a lot of character and demon designs for the SMT games. His style is immediately recognizable and the perfect fit for a Devil May Cry game. SMT, now that's a series we'll be talking about one day for sure. And a familiar someone might be featured in one of those games. You'll have to wait and see. Oh yeah, and Dante's form changes depending on the weapon currently equipped. So technically, he gets five different forms in this game. So cool. There are a ton of enemies in this game. You've got several different types of grunt demons, ranging from on-the-ground melee attackers to long-range projectile demons that attack you on your blind spots. The basic grunt enemies that you'll see throughout the entire game, the Seven Hells demons, might all look very similar at first, but all turn out to be completely different in their movesets. These guys reminded me a lot of the bloody puppets from DMC1, where those creatures all had a different color, representing their specific moves and attack patterns. There are also a few types of ranged enemies that will attack while either stationary or while flying around. Keeping these monsters' positions in mind is very important when balancing combat situations that feature both melee and ranged aggressors at the same time. There are also some unique and at first unpredictable groups of enemies like the Damned Chessmen. These possessed giant chess pieces all have unique attacks and appear in groups. They mix up a lot of the combat encounters you'll be fighting them in. Some chess pieces will use AoE attacks, some will strike you with basic sword swings, and some like the King and Queen will do a combination of both attack types. I've said it before, but there's so much depth in the combat in this game, not only in your movesets, but also in the enemy's attack patterns. It was definitely refreshing to play this title for the first time back in the day. Every encounter provides a very satisfying and rewarding challenge to overcome. 
And speaking of overcoming, the bosses in DMC3 range from giant hell monsters to one-on-one -on -one sword fights with enemies that are the same size as you, much like how the boss battles played out in DMC1. It's fun taking out huge monsters and gaining their powers, while also having Virgil, the persistent rival that levels up with you as you play, it's all very similar to the battles with Nello Angelo from the first game. Similar in both the gameplay and the story, you'll see. Besides the combat and enemies you'll be encountering, I'd like to talk about this game's levels and environments. They're way better than DMC2's. So throughout the game, you'll be ascending the demon tower known as Temene Gru. Yeah, it's a tongue twister. A lot of that adventure game DNA from the first two DMCs is present here, but it's obvious that the devs had combat in mind first and foremost. There are of course things like light puzzle solving and backtracking in some of the missions, but for the most part the game largely features missions that are combat heavy. Most of the combat rooms have a free controllable camera that focuses on Dante at all times, instead of the previous game's permanently fixed camera angles. Fixed cameras still make their appearances in DMC3, but they're predominantly used in areas when you're exploring and just walking around. There are still a few combat rooms that have fixed camera angles, and these battles can get a little annoying sometimes when, for example, a ranged enemy is shooting you off screen, and you have to figure out where it's coming from. My biggest complaints with DMC3's missions is that for pretty much all of the game, the puzzles are kept to a minimum, but for some reason the last three missions are very puzzle and platforming heavy. I feel these parts slow down the moment momentum of the story quite a bit, and it kind of feels like padding in certain places. Even though I'm not a fan of these weird puzzle levels, the game makes up for it with the final few bosses being like the most hype battles I've ever experienced in a video game. Putting all of these inconveniences aside, I can safely say that 95% of this title's missions are very fun and stay combat focused. Okay, let's move on to DMC3's story. So I didn't feel the need to cover the stories in my DMC1 and 2 videos, because honestly, there's not much to talk about with those games. Dante and the first Devil May Cry had some pretty great moments, and Lucia was kind of the real main character in DMC2. DMC3's story is an actual good video game story from start to finish, and with it being a prequel, we get to experience a familiar yet brand new type of Devil May Cry story, and probably the most relatable Dante out of the first three games so far. Just a heads up, I won't be covering every single little detail about the story, but if you guys want a deeper analysis of DMC3's narrative, I highly recommend checking out the YouTuber Codex Entry. He made a really great video talking all about DMC3's story in great detail, so go check that out. Okay, enough stalling. Let's get into it. Devil May Cry 3 begins with our main character, Dante, hanging out at his newly established office. On this fateful night, Dante is visited by a mysterious man offering him an invitation from his brother Virgil. The man effortlessly flips Dante's desk over and disappears as Dante evades and refocuses. After this sudden occurrence, Dante is jumped by a group of demons that have materialized out of thin air, mercilessly attacking and impaling him with their scythes. Unfazed by all of these attacks, Dante quickly recovers and we're treated to one of the most badass fight scenes in video game history. This party's getting crazy. Let's rock. Note to all of you aspiring game devs out there, if you're making an action game and you want the player to fall in love with your character, start your game like this. After dealing with his demonic attackers, Dante leaves his shop where he battles some more monsters and the powerful Hell Vanguard. Taking down the Vanguard, the ground begins to shake violently as we see the massive demon tower, Temeni Gru, emerge from the ground. On top of it is Dante's twin brother Virgil, looking down at us, quickly establishing him as our rival. Dante remarks it's been a full year since they last met, and confidently marches forth to take on this new incredible challenge. This is gonna be one hell of a party. As Dante proceeds onward, we see the man from before hanging with Virgil at the top of the tower. This guy's name is Arkham, and he's helped Virgil resurrect this ancient tower. 
Dante and Virgil's father, Sparta, was the one that sealed this tower away years ago. This already brings up some questions about why Virgil is doing this. Why would he want to undo his father's work in protecting humanity? We also learn that Virgil is the complete opposite of the wild at heart Dante. Virgil is calm, collected, and highly calculated with his words and his strength as we see him cut down the Hell Vanguard with a single strike. You can already tell that this kid is no joke. As the pieces of the Hell Vanguard fall from the tower, we see a young woman on a motorcycle approach the tower as well. I wonder what she's after. Stepping into the tower, we fight through boss after boss, gaining new weapons and abilities, and also meet up with an interesting jester who seems fairly shady, but also kind of helpful. He's really bizarre, and clearly, there's something strange going on with him behind the scenes. As we progress further into the game, we see what Virgil and Arkham are up to. Virgil lets Arkham know that a woman has entered the tower, and Arkham reveals that he happens to be acquainted with this woman, and will deal with her when the time comes. Speaking of this mysterious woman, we get to see how she handles a group of lesser demons in an awesome over-the-top gun kata fight scene where she destroys a group of demons with an impressive amount of grace and style. I like her. After this intense battle, we see the woman off in another part of the tower where Arkham confronts her. Here we learn that Arkham is the girl's father and that her mother has recently been murdered. Judging by how Arkham throws the girl off the tower and her firing back at him just missing a clean headshot, these two are not on good terms. As the girl falls, Dante is nearby and catches her. <laughs> well, this is my kind of rain. No wonder the sky looks so funny today. Let me go! Let you go? <laughs> but it would be a waste if you ended up as just a pretty stain. What the hell was that for? Here I am trying to help you, and you show your thanks by shooting me? Whatever. Do as you please. This girl is really tough, and every time she's on screen, I like her even more. As Dante ascends the tower, he eventually makes it to the top where he finds Virgil. You sure know how to throw a party. No food, no drinks, and the only babe just left. My sincerest apology, brother. I was so eager to see you, I couldn't concentrate on preparations for the bash. After exchanging a few words, the two begin fighting. Virgil is the first real battle in the game that feels like you're on equal footing with your opponent. He's the opposite of Dante in his style and personality, but through combat, the two are a lot similar than they'd ever want to admit. After the boss battle, we learn why Virgil is doing all of this. To gain more power. More specifically, his father's power, which is locked away in the underworld, and this tower is the key to getting there. Foolishness, Dante. Foolishness. Might controls everything. And without strength, you cannot protect anything. Even after defeating Virgil, he quickly recovers and overpowers Dante, stealing Dante's pendant and stabbing him with his own sword. This stab from the Devil Sword Rebellion unlocks Dante's true power, the Devil Trigger. Dante recovers and retaliates, but Virgil and Arkham escape before Dante's strength fully recovers. Rising up stronger than he was before, Dante recovers and battles through a giant whale demon and meets up with the mysterious girl again. Dante asks the girl what her name is, but she tells him she doesn't have a name. Dante then decides to call her Lady. After battling through more of the tower, fighting new bosses like Nevin, gaining new weapons and power, and meeting up with the Jester again, we see Virgil and Arkham opening a large stone door. Virgil asks why Arkham hasn't taken care of Lady yet, and he asks him if his fatherly love is preventing him from killing her. Before Arkham answers, Virgil stabs him. We learn that Arkham sacrificed his wife, Lady's mother, to attain his demonic power. This made Virgil trust Arkham originally, but now he's beginning to doubt Arkham's will to see all of this through. Virgil swiftly kills Arkham. Shortly after this happens, Dante finds Arkham's body, and Lady is close behind him. Lady asks if Dante killed Arkham, then the two begin to fight. Lady feels like she's been robbed of her revenge. 
She explains how her father was obsessed with becoming a demon and how he did everything he could to achieve this goal, even murdering his wife. With Arkham being dead, Lady feels like her revenge has been taken from her. She tells Dante he wouldn't understand a family rivalry because he's a demon himself. Dante leaves Lady alone, and as soon as he leaves, Arkham wakes up again, almost like a different person. Arkham begs and pleads with Lady, telling her that Virgil made him do all of this, and that he would never murder his own family. Arkham dies again in Lady's arms. Lady believes what he told her, and with her new goal in mind, Lady seeks out Virgil. Exploring more of the tower, Dante fights more demons, taking their powers for himself. But we also get to see Virgil fighting a demon we weren't able to kill before. Virgil's leveling up with us, and it's genius because the game is showing us that the next time these two fight, it's not gonna be easy. After killing the demon Beowulf, Virgil combines his and Dante's amulets to open the Hellgate. For some reason, it's not working, and Dante shows up to fight once more. Virgil's way more difficult in this fight because of his new hand-to-hand -hand moveset equipped with a devastating dive kick. Also, the song in this battle is really good. I just thought I should throw that out there. As the Sons of Sparta duke it out, Lady shows up interrupting them. She seems very unsure about her new target. Could Virgil really have driven Arkham to doing all of this? As Dante and Virgil collapse from exhaustion, we hear someone clapping. Bravo! Bravo! I never dreamed that things would go so smoothly. Well done, everyone! Well done! You. Don't be a bad girl, Mary. Or you can expect a spanking from Daddy later. Just as gonna spank your butt, spank you on the bum. buffoon! I don't know where you came from, but you don't belong here. Now leave! Zowie, that was close. But you've taken quite a trouncing today, haven't you, Virgil? You could have chopped me into confetti by now if you were in tip-top condition. Damn you! You have lost. Because you underestimated humans. What's going on? It turns out Arkham was the jester this whole time. I guess he attained some kind of demonic power, but it turned him into a clown. That says a lot about his character. Arkham stabs Lady, shedding her blood onto the altar, the final piece of the ritual. Lady quickly recovers, getting her launcher back, and Dante and Virgil surround Arkham. Arkham reminds Virgil of what's about to happen, and then he dispatches our three heroes with one of the sickest kicks I've ever seen. Impressive. I expected nothing less from the Devil's descendants. But aren't you forgetting something, Virgil? The spell is broken. What do you think will happen next? Let's welcome chaos. Arkham is a lot stronger than he appears. The altar rises up out of the ground. Arkham has almost completed his mission of becoming a god. We see Virgil falling into darkness as the room crumbles. Dante catches Lady at the last second, and the two split up to go after Arkham. Lady still doesn't trust Dante. After rising all the way to the top, Arkham opens the Hellgate. As Dante climbs the tower once again, he makes it to the library where he finds Lady. Lady seems injured, and Dante tells her to sit this one out. This angers her enough to attack Dante, resulting in a boss fight. Lady's fight is pretty fun. She uses the environment to sneak around you and stay out of sight. I'll take care of him. Why do you care so much? This whole business started with my father sealing the entrance between the two worlds. And now... My brother's trying to break that spell and turn everything into Demonville. This is my family matter, too. Quite frankly, at first, I didn't give a damn. But because of you, I know what's important now. I know what I need to do.
The scene is so awesome because these two characters start this game not caring about each other or their motivations. But through battle, Dante proves his worth and finally gets the chance to explain himself, sympathizing with Lady and gaining her trust. Lady lets Dante borrow her signature rocket launcher, the Kalina Anne, named after her late mother. Dante leaves Lady to rest and continues onward. Reaching the top of the tower once again, Dante steps through the Hellgate where he finds Arkham now taking on the demonic form of his father, Sparta. After a quick confrontation, Arkham begins to show Dante his true power by disappointingly transforming into a blob. I love how all of Arkham's strongest forms are the most pathetic, lamest things ever. You were just Sparta, but you chose to turn into a pile of goop. Okay then. During this fight, Dante realizes that Arkham's new form isn't going to go down that easily. Come to retrieve my power. You can't handle it. <laughs> Look at you, making a big dramatic entrance and stealing my spotlight. Why? <laughs> you don't possibly believe that he deserves to be our main event now, do you? Now that you mention it, you're right. You should come to realize you cannot control the power of Sparta. You're wasting your time, buddy. Putting their rivalry aside, Dante and Virgil team up to take this clown out once and for all. The second phase of this fight is so good. Virgil matches Dante's movement and gameplay, and pressing the style button calls Virgil to Dante's side. I like this because through gameplay, the devs are kind of showing us that Virgil still cares about his brother a little bit. He's always there when you need him. After a long battle, the two brothers come together, using each other's weapons to finally take down the mutated Arkham. I'll try it your way for once. Remember what we used to say? Jackpot. Not very classy for someone's dying words. Badass. Losing all of his power, Arkham is sent back through the Hellgate, falling at the feet of his very angry daughter. What a surprise. Here I was looking for you, and lo and behold, you come to me. Mary. Don't ever call me that again. My mother was the only one who could say my name. Wait. Please. Do you really want to shoot me? Can you shoot me? Your own father. What have I done wrong? Even the heroic Sparta sacrificed a woman so that he could become a legend. I wish to be a god! And I sacrificed one miserable human being for that reason. That is all. Was that really so awful? I have some unfinished business to take care of. Help me, Mary. Mary died a long time ago. My name is Lady. Goodbye, Father. <gasps> no! <laughs> this scene is amazing. Lady gets the most brutal kill in the game, completing her mission of revenge, but at a significant cost. She's left broken, and we all know she did the right thing, but killing your own father is something you'll probably never recover from. This girl has been through so much today, I just, I just want to give her a big hug. Meanwhile, Dante and Virgil, still stuck on the other side of the Hellgate, face off one last time. 
Virgil, with Sparta's sword in hand, tells Dante to give him his amulet. After a full game of both of these kids gaining more and more power, Virgil still needs more. We are the sons of Sparta. Within each of us flows his blood. But more importantly, his soul! And now, my soul is saying it wants to stop you! <laughs> Unfortunately, our souls are at odds, brother. I need more power. I love how cheesy that line is, and even Virgil laughs at Dante over it. Virgil's need for power won't ever be met, and with this, the final battle begins. The third fight with Virgil is incredible. When the game first came out, it took me forever to beat him. He really pulls out all the stops in this fight, using all of the moves he's learned throughout the game and his devil trigger to absurdly extend his combos. Towards the end of the fight, Virgil will teleport right up to you or on top of you, coming down with what seems like an infinite amount of slamming sword attacks. He uses his katana, Yamato, with his father's sword, Force Edge, to do extra damage. You really have to stay away from him and choose your attacks carefully when you see an opening. After a very long fight, Dante barely comes out on top, and with the demon gate closing in the distance, he has one last thing he needs to do. Stop Virgil, even if it means killing him. The two sons of Sparta begin their final charge at one another. <laughs> No one can have this, Dante. It's mine. It belongs to a son of Sparta. Leave me and go. If you don't want to be trapped in the demon world, I'm staying. This place was our father's home. I love this so much. Even after all of their fighting and rivalry, Dante still loves his brother. Even though he tries, he can't save him from falling into darkness. As Virgil falls into hell, Dante takes up his father's sword and leaves the underworld behind. Dante returns Kalina Ann to Lady, and you can feel the tension between these two has faded. Lady is way more relaxed now that her mission is complete, and Dante seems quieter after losing his brother. These two have gone through a lot tonight. Losing a loved one is never easy, even if they're consumed by a deep hatred for another family member or the need for more power. Sometime after this, Lady helps Dante get back on his feet, and together they agree to help each other on their never-ending quest to keep evil at bay. And that includes rebuilding Dante's business, finally deciding on a name for his shop, too. Wanna know the name? Devil May Cry. DMC3's story is very special. Being a prequel, Itsuno-san and his team were able to wipe the slate clean of the events that came before in the other games, starting fresh, basically rebooting Dante's story and fleshing out his character so much more. The story of this game is an incredible standalone adventure, while also adding more weight to the events of DMC1, recontextualizing a lot of what happens in that game. The demonic swordsman Nello Angelo is Virgil, seeing him fall into hell at the end of DMC3, and then finding him as this mind-controlled puppet for the demon king Mundus, his father's sworn enemy is incredibly tragic. 
It also helps DMC2 make more sense because with the added backstory of DMC3, we kind of get a reason for that quiet version of Dante. DMC2 takes place after the first game, and obviously Dante would be pretty down about having to kill his possessed husk of a brother on Malay Island. See, even DMC3 is fixing parts of DMC2. It's crazy how well thought out this game is. A lot of credit should be given to this game's writer, Bingo Morihashi. He was able to take the somewhat empty lore of the first two games and elevate what they brought to the table in a great way, giving these characters a lot of personality and clear, understandable motivations while providing some great twists and emotional moments along the way. Dante is such a memorable character in this game, and a lot of what makes him great is his portrayal by Just Cause Entertainment's actor stuntman, Ruben Langdon. During the development of this game's story, the developers had many disagreements on how Dante should act. Langdon was given direction from the writers, who told him to ignore the direction of the director, and vice versa, eventually leading him to do his own thing, in some cases rewriting lines for him and his cast members. Director Itsuno was actually impressed with what Langdon was doing, and at the end of the day, this all turned out to be what Itsuno Osan envisioned for the character originally. And honestly, what Langdon was doing falls perfectly in line with Dante's rebellious nature. So a lot of what makes Dante great came straight from Langdon's personality and portrayal of the character. That also goes for Virgil's actor, Dan Southworth. Southworth and Langdon met while working on Power Rangers years before DMC3, and Langdon has described Southworth as the closest person he's ever had to being a brother. This explains why both actors have so much chemistry in their scenes together. That brotherly dynamic is a real thing, and we see it come out in Virgil and Dante. These two guys were the perfect casting for these characters, and both of their performances elevate the material so much more. Okay, can I talk about Lady now? I love this girl so much. Lady is one of the most badass and capable female characters of all time. At the beginning of the game, she starts off as a brat, but you find out that she has a genuine reason for being this way. Her father is an idiot that did something really stupid and she wants justice for this, and takes him out in the most ruthless, cold way imaginable. She also has probably my favorite design, and I've even modeled some of my real life looks after her. What can I say, as soon as I saw her for the first time back in the day, she became one of my favorites. Her voice actress, Kari Walgren, did a fantastic job at portraying an unsure, slightly misguided, but overall badass chick who could handle pretty much everything that's thrown at her. I love this character, and there's not much more I can say to justify her badassness. It's obvious that for DMC3, everyone involved with this game's development gave it their all. From the writers, to the actors, to the people responsible for doing the graphics, and the director with the vision gave this game a lot of love. It also paid off too because DMC3's vanilla release sold over 2 million copies. Then, its special edition re-release sold another million copies just a year later. This title's release and success revitalized the Devil May Cry series, resulting in a multi-part manga release, a very expensive commercial starring Ruben Langdon as Dante, it's really good, go watch it, and a full animated series created by legendary anime studio, Madhouse. Devil May Cry 3 is a game that never stops giving you 110% of what it has to offer in the most stylish way possible. This game was made with nothing but love and respect for Hideki Kamiya's work on DMC1. Going back to where it all began and crafting something truly legendary paid off big time for Capcom and Devil May Cry. Itsuno-san definitely cleared his name with DMC3 and would no longer be remembered as the guy that made some really good fighting games back in the day, and then a really bad adventure game he didn't want anything to do with. Instead, he's gone down as the guy responsible for making one of the best action games ever made. If, for some reason, you haven't played DMC3 yet, I highly recommend it. The game is readily available thanks to the DMC HD collection that you can get on most modern consoles and PC. If you haven't played the first game, I'd say another great starting point would be DMC3. It's very much worth your time. You won't regret it. Hard work, not relying on surveys, keeping to one person's vision, and hiring extremely passionate and talented people to give it their all is exactly how Devil May Cry 3 saved the franchise. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this love letter to DMC3. I just want to give a big shout out to Itla for making the level 3 Devil Sue for this video. I love the Kazuma Kaneko design for this one. Thank you, Itla. If you guys like this video, please consider subscribing and checking out my Patreon link down in the description. You can support this channel for as little as $1 per month. 
If you pledge to my higher tier, you'll gain access to my bonus show called Inside the Sphere. It's a more laid-back podcast-style show where I talk about video game news and what I've been up to. Huge shout-outs to everyone currently supporting me on there. I love you all. Anyway, it was nice going down memory lane today, and I'll see you all in my next video. Later.